Good morning again. Um, thank you. Where's David? Kai. There you are. Thank you. That was phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that with us. And while I'm acknowledging people, let me acknowledge Ian Mahoney. Where's Ian? Is he here? What? Excuse me, Ian Kaufman. Put him in the wrong family. <laughs> Ian was here to play the piano for us this morning. I also got to see him in a play Friday. Um, and I understand he will be back in that play next Friday and Saturday. So if you get some time on your hands, you might want to talk with his parents about getting tickets. It's worth, it's worth it. Let me say again, good morning to those who are here with us online. I don't want you to ever think that we don't miss you, but I do want you to know on behalf of this congregation that we covet that you're attending in the way that you can. So please get that extra cup of coffee, get your Bibles. We'll go to God's Word together. Let's turn to Acts 16. We've been talking about visions and dreams, and here's, a, here's another one. Acts 16, let's look at verse 9. We're going to read down through uh, verse 15. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we, were, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. These are the words of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, let the words of my heart and the meditations of everyone that can hear your word this morning here be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Let me apologize to you in advance. I'm under the weather this morning and... Uh, I've threatened Debbie several times with her having to take over. And of course, she said every time, I got it. I think I'm okay, but I'm uh, not real strong. I'm going to talk to you about laboring outside the gate. And this is the last in our series about the Holy Spirit. To this point, we've been paying a lot of attention to the actions of Peter. From Peter's first speech in Jerusalem to confrontation with religious leaders, to Philip on the verge of Africa, to Cornelius the centurion, we've caught a sense of the birth of the early church and the power of the Holy Spirit. Today we move on to Acts 16 and we encounter the apostle Paul as he too listens to the Holy Spirit to find his direction. I was watching a TV program not long ago and one fellow said to the other, I'm thinking inside the box. <laughs> the other fellow says, what do you mean? I thought you were supposed to think outside the box these days. 
First guy says, well, in a way I am. Everyone's so busy thinking outside the box, there's plenty of room inside. <laughs> I was sitting there mentally processing that exchange and it occurred to me that both were saying the same thing. To not be limited in the way we come to problem solving. Sometimes you just need to find another way to get your message out. The Apostle Paul, when I read him, I just get tired. He was this amazing force of energy. Everywhere he went, he ran the risk of overpowering those he came to serve because he was like the Tasmanian devil. You know that cartoon character that spins everywhere he goes? Like a buzzsaw taking down everything in his path? Paul's uncompromising enthusiasm got him bounced out of town a lot. From Athens to Iconium to Antioch and others, Paul got used to being jailed and jeered and escorted to the city limits. Maybe he was just too demanding, too strong for the people who heard him, but along the way he learned he honed his delivery of the gospel, and Paul never worried about what to do. He was guided by the Holy Spirit, and he responded to that call, no matter where it took him. At the beginning of what we now call Paul's second missionary journey, he's in the region of Phrygia and Galatia, an area in modern-day Turkey, east of the Mediterranean Sea. And he's preparing to take the gospel east to Asia. But Paul hears from the Holy Spirit. And the word is, no, don't go to Asia. So Paul tries to go north to the region of Bithynia around the Black Sea. And again, the Holy Spirit stops him. Not exactly knowing what to do, and being denied access both east and north, Paul turns west. He goes back toward the Mediterranean and comes to the port town of Troas. And there in the night, Paul has a vision. He sees a man from Macedonia, the region west of Paul that we now know as the Greek Peninsula. And the man in Paul's vision says to come over and help him. Well, that was what Paul needed, and he acted on that sign. The scripture says that immediately they sought to go. They concluded that they had been called to preach the gospel there. In the book of Acts, you might notice that right here, the pronouns shift from third to second person, from he, they, to we. In other words, we can probably assume that now Luke, who's the writer of this, has joined Paul for the journey. It's worrisome trying to discern God's call in our lives. God has a lot of competition, don't you think? We hear many voices. We get much advice. I read the other day, still blows my mind. A modern grocery store in the United States carries an average of 25,000 items. 25,000. For instance, there are 186 varieties of cereal. I'm sorry, but for me that is selection overload. How are we supposed to make sense of all the choices with which we are faced? Even if we've chosen to follow God, what church do we join? How do we become disciples? What exactly does Jesus want us to do? And how is that revealed to us? The passage we're looking at provides us with some answers, though they might not be exactly in our comfort zone. Let's take a closer look. Luke tells us that Paul and Silas are traveling and working together in Derby and Lystra 
a young man named Timothy joins them. And they're right at the doorstep of Asia. Paul thinks that's where he's supposed to go next. But a funny thing happens. Luke tells us they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go east into Asia. So Paul's idea is shot down. And then he thinks of going north, but while he's preparing for that, he's shut down again. Instead, Paul receives a vision. There's that Spirit of God again. And it says he's to go west, back into Greece. So the Holy Spirit has found a way to speak to Paul. And Paul has let himself be guided by the Holy Spirit. So far, so good. If God has Paul called, Paul call, called Paul to go west, <laughs> then west it is. Surely there will be a warm reception for this group so dedicated to spreading the gospel. Well, according to what Luke tells us, not exactly. They get passage on a boat and they go from Troas to Samothrace to Neapolis to Philippi. Luke tells us that Philippi was a leading city in Macedonia and that it was a Roman colony. What he doesn't say here is that the Jewish population is so small in Philippi, there's not even a synagogue. There's no base of operations. Paul always started in the synagogue and worked his way out, but in Philippi, that option was not available. Then Luke tells us that the group stayed in the city for some days, and on the Sabbath, with no synagogue in which to worship, this little band of evangelists, and I'm quoting, went outside the gate to the riverside. They went there because they supposed there was a place of prayer there. And there they found a group of women, women who were worshiping together. And they spoke to them. So let's just stop here for a moment and revisit this sequence from the point of view of modern discipleship. Paul picks two wrong destinations. Then he embarks on a third based upon a vision in the night. That's the way most of y'all react to your life situations, isn't it? His logic has led him to two other directions, but instead he follows a dream. Next, as he embarks upon this journey of unknown destination, Paul takes on not just Luke, but also young Timothy to look after. And then third, they set sail and bypass three cities to arrive in a fourth where there's no synagogue, no base from which to operate. Then on the Sabbath, they go looking for a place to worship. And the pickings are so slim that they leave the city hoping they might find some kindred spirits out by the river. And last, and this is contextual, we don't do this today, but this is today, and that was then. They take their message to a few women gathered there. Women in that day and time had little to no influence it was a male-dominated society. Paul's missionary journey so far looked amateurish and disorganized and unplanned and doomed for failure. Wrong direction, too many amateurs alone for the ride, no advanced planning, no base, no church, no contacts, and now an audience of women by the river. What a start. I took church planning in seminary, and believe me, this course of action is not in the textbooks. <laughs> Paul had nothing in his tool bag with which to go soul saving, much less church planting. Well, actually, Paul did have a couple things in that bag of his, things that we really need to remember in our day and time. First of all, he had faith, and he had a bucket full. And secondly, he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, he adapted. 
Paul understood that the success of his mission did not depend on his talent or his work ethic. It didn't depend on advanced planning or even contacts. It depended on his faith and his obedience and how he could bring those traits to bear in a given situation. The rest of the story is about what God can do with faith and obedience and a little adaptability. It's a story that might be worth remembering as a template for visioning here at NPC. One of the women in the prayer group was named Lydia. She was up from Thyatira, a bustling city down the coastal ways, and she was a merchant, a very successful merchant. She sold purple goods, and in that day it probably meant she was well-to-do. It turns out that Lydia already believed in God. Paul took her to the next level and told her about Jesus, and she believed, and she was baptized, and so was her household. And guess what? Paul had a new base of operations. The next chapter in Paul's journey, if you read ahead, included a stint in jail for intruding on the local economy of several merchants who were cashing in on the misfortunes of a slave girl possessed by a demon. Dealing with the demon cost Paul and Silas their freedom. Then there's the earthquake and a jailer who becomes a convert and quite a few other adventures. I don't understand why this isn't on TV. <laughs> Once again, Paul and Silas got the boot, but isn't it interesting where they head? The chapter ends with them on the way to Lydia's house. What did Paul accomplish and how did he accomplish it? It wasn't textbook. It wasn't much about Paul or his gifts or his training. It was way more about obedience to the call that Paul heard. Later, Philippi was to have its own Christian following. But on that Sabbath, Paul faithfully and obediently brought the message of the gospel to an unlikely audience of women, women praying at the river. No church, no synagogue, no men, just a group of women. And one of them turned out to be the first convert for Jesus in Macedonia. But what about Paul? He made all those tactical mistakes how could he experience any success? The answer lies in verse 14 in our passage today. If you don't remember anything about what I've been saying, try to take this one home. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said. Let me say that again. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said. The Greek nouns here are informative when we read that Lydia was a worshiper of God, the Greek word there is theos, which means God. When we read that Lydia's heart was opened by the Lord, the word changes to kurios, which means Lord, not God. This is a different name. It's used almost always in the New Testament to mean Jesus Jesus, not Paul, opened Lydia's heart. That's why she heard Paul. And that's how she became the first European convert on record. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see, it doesn't matter that Paul got it wrong. It doesn't matter that his missionary journey was ill-conceived and poorly planned. What matters is that Paul faithfully showed up. I love that term. If you walk through the Bible looking for it and realize how many times it's just a matter of being there, 
you'll be amazed. Just keep showing up. And Luke tells it because God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What matters is that Paul and company were obedient to the call. Have you ever felt like you've been called to do a job? Maybe to change jobs, change towns, change direction of some kind. And you just know in your heart, it, it's a pull. You know that's what you ought to do. And I suspect some of you can say, yes, I felt that. And I didn't act on it. I've certainly done that. And I regret those times. They did teach me. They taught me to quit doing that. <laughs> and to hear that call. No matter what the consequences might be, because God has got our backs. What matters is that Paul learned to adapt not his values, but his style and his delivery to suit the needs of the audience he had. It didn't matter that it was a woman's prayer group on a riverbank instead of a congregation of hundreds or thousands. Paul was obedient to the call. We need to pay close attention to this lesson. It's difficult, really difficult, not to hear the voice of tradition, the voice of our society. This is the way we've always done it. If I had a nickel, everybody know what that means? That's a southern thing, probably. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I'd have a pocket full of change. This is the way we've always done it. Well, so what? It's hard to change, it's hard to adapt, and it can be very uncomfortable. Think about how Paul must have felt that Sunday, or rather Saturday, walking outside the city gate to find his audience. When the voices of the world crowd in on us, and they do, and they will continue to. We have to listen, really listen for that still, small voice. Sometimes it may even come in a dream. When the choices of our existence scream for our attention, we have to believe and be obedient to that voice when we're given the opportunity, we have to labor outside the gate. I want you to think of Norbert Presbyterian Church and imagine this is your gate. And when you walk outside those doors, you're in the mission field. A mission field that doesn't have to be in Ethiopia. It can be right out there on the street. Paul found a way to get his message out. We have to listen, but not just with our ears. We have to feel our own pulse, that heartbeat of God himself beating within us through the Holy Spirit. We have to see God calling us in the eyes of those around us, those who we used to unsee. Now with the eyes of the Spirit, they're no longer invisible to us. And once you see that which you couldn't see for so long, you will have a major problem ever unseeing it again. We have to go where God sends us. Say what God tells us and do what God bids us. When we do, the Lord will open hearts to pay attention to what we say for him. Let's pray together. Dear Father, your scriptures are such a gift to us. When we 
read about the early church and see the perils of Paul and the adventures of Peter and company, help us to read those stories and realize their directions. You guide us, and you do so so gently, but you do want us in your fold. We know you want us to labor outside the gate, and it's very uncomfortable for us and awkward. Help us to reach inside and feel the truth that you've given to us. And understand that we too can adapt and we certainly can show up. Help us to feel your word within us and help us to unleash the Holy Spirit dwelling in each and every one of us so that we can find our call wherever that might take us. We'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.